This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Finland's formally joining NATO today in a move that doubles NATO's border with Russia. Finland and Russia share an 800-mile border. Finland's joining the military alliance a week after Turkey's parliament voted to ratify its membership. Turkey and Hungary have yet to approve Sweden as a member of NATO. The Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has rejected Sweden's accession to NATO after accusing it of harboring Kurdish dissidents he considers terrorists and want extradited. Finland and Sweden has applied together to join NATO. They did in May of 2022, about three months after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This is NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg speaking today. Today is an historic day, because in a few hours we will welcome Finland as the 31st member of our alliance. This will make Finland safer and NATO stronger. By becoming a member, uh, Finland uh, will get an ironclad security guarantee. Uh, Article 5, our collective defense clause, one for all, all for one, will now, from today, apply for Finland. The Kremlin has decried Finland joining NATO as a, quote, assault on our security, unquote. On Monday, Russian authorities announced they'll beef up its military presence in northwestern Russia. We're joined now by two guests. Reiner Brown is the former executive director of the International Peace Bureau, a German peace activist, historian and author who's campaigned against the U.S. air base in Rammstein and against NATO. He's joining us from Berlin. And in Helsinki, Finland, we're joined by Alfa Harnier. He is a Finnish politician uh, currently serving in the parliament of Finland for the Green League at the Helsinki constituency. Um, let's begin uh, with Alta uh, Harjane. Uh, you are with the Green Party in Finland. It used to be opposed to joining NATO, but switched last year. Can you talk about why you feel today is so significant? Today is, of course, significant, as, as we heard Mr. Stoltenberg uh, talk there, that, that it's a historic day as, as Finland joins the alliance. And, uh, and I think we see it necessary in the time, but also not just guaranteeing and helping out uh, to boost our security, but also us contributing more to the security of, of whole Europe. Uh, yeah, and, and the Green Party, we used to be a bit dubious uh, uh, towards the membership, of course, everything changed uh, in February 2020, and uh, and there has been a, a kind of like a also vocal uh, vocal proponents of NATO for years already, and me included, for example. But but yeah, everything pretty much changed uh, with the Russian attack in Ukraine. And and what is your response to? Uh to the Russian position that the continued expansion of uh, NATO further uh, eastward uh, is actually a threat uh, to Russia's security? Well, uh, I think it's very typical paranoid speech and the narrative of Kremlin, that it's kind of like a some kind of surrounded fo fortress. Uh, the fact is that NATO is purely defensive alliance for the for, for Europe and uh, and of course uh, it's the actions into NATO is, is based on each country's voluntary choice to do so so it's a purely I think uh, paranoid Kremlin narrative that is that the main audience is actually the domestic audience there. When you say purely defensive, I I, I would think that people who uh, live in uh, Serbia or in uh, Libya, my question whether NATO is purely a defensive uh, alliance. Yep, well, that is uh, that is true. Of course, NATO has been uh, uh, ha having a role also in, in this, uh, this, like, um, these operations. Uh, but looking at from the perspective of Finland joining uh, the alliance, this is seen as, as completely uh, a defensive act uh, in order to kind of boost the European security as a whole. NATO as such poses no threat to Russia militarily, only in terms of securing uh, defense and thus kind of providing a, a certain stop and limit for Russian uh, aggression and, and, and the idea of creating this sphere of influence with aggressive uh, policies or even with uh, violence. 
Rona Brown, if you can respond from Berlin to what is happening today, um, Finland joining NATO, um, your response? You know, it is not an historical day. The day today is the end of a longer story. Finland was, all the last years, a part of the NATO command and control system, a part of many NATO exercises, including NATO troops in Finland, and enlarging their military budget to over 2 percent, like NATO. So it is the end of a militarization of Finland and the whole region. And this day is not historical. It is a breakthrough of the history of Finland. It was a neutral country, from my understanding, with a lot of successes in peacekeeping missions, in having big international peace events like the Helsinki Conference for 1975. This time is over. And for what? For having more Russian troops nearer to the border? For having maybe even nuclear weapons on both sides? Now they are saying only on the Russian side are new nuclear weapons. But let us wait for two or three years. And this makes it again a step for the escalation in Europe, and not a peaceful step. And friendly speaking, to say NATO is a defense military alliance. Have we forgotten Libya? Have we forgotten Afghanistan? Have we forgotten Yugoslavia? I think this is really stupid. And let me say one more sentence to NATO. NATO said it's a North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This is not any longer true. NATO is the biggest military alliance in the world, with main focus also surrounding China, with all the new agreements with Japan, uh, South Korea, Malaysia, Philippines, and an end. So it is the biggest, historically biggest military alliance in the world. And it is not definitely making peace. It is even creating many problems for peace and security. Well, can you talk, uh, uh, Ryder Brown, about the uh, significance of the German vice chancellor's surprise visit to Kiev? You know, again, you know, quite all the members of the German parliament were visiting Kiev up to now, and the minister of economy was missing. And what he is doing, he was going with the big industry of our country, because in the redeveloping of the country, in the reconstruction of the country, Ukraine, also the German industry wants to earn a lot of money, like we are the profiteur of all the new developments in East Germany and in East Europe. And that is the main reason that he is going. And the interesting point is that they are discussing about the reconstruction of Ukraine. But what is needed for the reconstruction of Ukraine? The first step must be ceasefire and negotiations. So hopefully the minister Habeck will come to the great idea to support our position that immediately ceasefire and negotiation for Ukraine are needed, that we can start with the reconstruction of these heavily destroyed country. Rainer Brown, if you can talk about the proposal put forward by German politicians um, for a negotiation that um, the Ukrainian president Zelensky rejected this weekend. You know, interestingly, he rejected our appeal by his deputy foreign minister, but he's supporting the suggestions from China, which are quite of the same level, saying we need negotiations for overcoming this brutal war. And the idea behind it is that no one can win this war militarily. So the alternative is continuing of day-to-day -day killing. We have more than 200,000 dead people up to now. And when we are thinking about the so-called military spring offensives, we will have maybe again the same number. What is the alternative? The alternative is not to accept the actual situation, but to stop the war and start for negotiations about a new development in Ukraine and a new peace process in Europe. And our suggestion is that it's impossible to do this from the European perspective. Because the European countries, but all, are deeply engaged in the war by training the Ukrainian soldiers, by sending weapons, by spy offensives, and by security purposes. So the only possibility is 
that we have an international peace coalition coming from the global south being the moderator or mediator for peace process. And this is why we are saying we are supporting the suggestion of Brazil and China, Indonesia and India to develop such a peace coalition. And we hope that this peace coalition will get the support of the government of Germany and France. In any case, we will work for this. And this could create an atmosphere for coming to negotiations and for stopping these day-to-day -day killing and for opening the door for a peaceful and better future for Ukraine, but for the whole Europe, because the alternative is the escalation. And we see it with the depleted uranium. We see it with the new nukes in Belarusia. We have step by step escalating the situation, which has the danger to lead to a nuclear war. The alternative is negotiations and ceasefire. And I'd like to bring in uh, Ate Harnier again to talk about the, this issue of is a ceasefire and negotiations uh, possible toward a, a diplomatic solution of the war? You've advocated uh, in the past pushing European governments to offer more military weaponry to Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think the clear thing is here that negotiations over peace, uh, about peace cannot be done over the heads of the Ukrainians. Ukraine is a sovereign nation being under uh, criminal assault by Russia. So we have to avoid this false symmetry in the situation. About escalation, it pretty much seems that Russia is kind of just using the escalation thing as a basis to kind of try to limit the support for Ukraine. And we should make sure that as democratic Western countries, we make sure that we help Ukrainians to protect their own sovereignty, their own human lives, their freedom, and also the values that we hold dear. But of course, in the end, after war comes peace. And we have to make sure that there's, there is room for peace, but it cannot be negotiated over Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians. So they have, ha have, have, they have had to say over the, over the terms. And in the meantime, it's very important to keep the military support and the civil support on a level that helps the Ukrainians to gain the upper hand and maintain the upper hand in this war, which is completely, uh, uh, completely the, the whole responsibility over the over the war lies in Russia and in Kremlin. Uh, Dr. Haryane, if you can also talk about the election that just took place in Finland, you have a new prime minister, correct me if I'm mispronouncing his name, uh, Petri Orpo, who eked out a victory at 20.8 percent of the vote, um, center-right National Coalition Party, against um, the prime minister Marin's party, the center-left Social Democrats, who got almost 20 percent. These are very small numbers. Um, what does this mean for Finland? Well, uh, I think it means uh, a, a kind of turn towards a more conservative right-wing uh, path. Uh, I think the main issue here is the economy. So, kind of the uh, how the, the make sure that we uh, or the, the the prime goal of the of the new prime minister is is to combat the debt of of and, and balance the economy uh, of Finland. Uh, so that's that's been the, the main issue regarding <coughs> regarding the elections, regarding foreign and security policy. Uh, as, as you know, the NATO decision in Finland was done with overwhelming majority. Uh, no parliamentary body or parties uh, has been opposing really the the accession. So probably the or it's clear that the the, the foreign security security policy line, the idea that we're committed to NATO. And, uh, and also committed to support Ukraine. Uh, I don't see any major changes there. Um, Prime Minister Marin, uh, she actually she did eke out of, out of victory that so that her party gained more seats, which is quite uh, unusual for a sitting prime minister. Uh, and she's still as a person who uh, gained a massive amount of votes in her constituency. But uh, but yeah, so the issue rather is, is domestic and largely economic and, and uh, regional economic uh, matters that, that really uh, then uh, decided the vote, so to say. 
Yes, um, Ryan O'Brien, we only have about a, about 30 seconds or so, but could you talk about the anti-war movement in Germany, your plans for April, and how the German media is covering the war in Ukraine? You know, we have we are in front of our Easter marches. We will have 10,000 of people on the street during the next days. That are one step of our big activities. And, you know, we are following up the big activities in Munich and Berlin in the beginning of the year. But to my colleague, he has a misunderstanding of the war. It's not only Russia and Ukraine in the war. It's a proxy war and a civil war. And to say the whole responsibility lies by, Ukraine, by Russia, these underestimate the development to the war, and I think this is a really big mistake not to see what's happening with the Minsk agreement and why our chancellor and Macron was lying about the Minsk agreement and don't want to make it. So I think it is really very much too easy to say that the whole responsibility lies by Russia.